is located on a glacial ridge about two kilometers south of the town of Elfin, which was an important ecclesiastical settlement in the early medieval period. The site consists of an early medieval enclosure with an annex to the western side. Site director Brian O'Hara tells us the story of Killini's too. Early medieval enclosures are commonly called ring forts or fairy forts. There's about 48,500 recorded by the Archaeological Survey of Ireland. I suppose archaeologists don't really like the term ring fort anymore, so we refer to them as early medieval enclosures. In Irish they're known as a rath, a dune, a car, a cashel or lis. These different names refer to the different methods of construction used. So anywhere with one of those place names usually has a ring fort nearby. So the early medieval period dates from approximately 400 AD to 1169 AD. It begins really with the introduction of Christianity into Ireland and ends with the Norman invasion in 1169. What marks the early medieval period from the preceding Iron Age is obviously the introduction of Christianity. But we also see much more evidence for settlement in the early medieval period. We have very few Iron Age settlement sites in Ireland. So what was an early medieval enclosure, such as the one excavated at Killinese too? They're a type of fortified farmstead, usually occupied by a single family group. In the early medieval period, we didn't have towns or cities in Ireland, really. And what we have are clusters of enclosures beside each other. So these clusters of early medieval enclosures were generally occupied by a family group or a kin group. The site of Killinese is extremely large. We excavated the northern portion of the enclosure, so the area that we excavated measured about 45 metres east-west and 30 metres north-south, so there, it was quite large uh, compared to other uh, ring forts that have been excavated. I suppose one of the more unusual aspects about it is that the enclosure itself wasn't circular. It was more curvilinear or oval in shape, the excavated portion, and that seems to be due to the need for water management on the site. The soil on top of the ridge here at Killing East is quite impermeable to water, so water management was a major issue for ourselves and I'm sure it was a major issue for the people who constructed the enclosure. What kind of person would have constructed an enclosure such as the one at Killing East? In order to dig a ditch around an early medieval enclosure, a lot of resources had to be deployed, so you're taking people away from the other kind of work they would have to carry out, farming and, and so forth. But the fact that there was an annex for livestock attached to the western side, that necessitated more ditch digging, which is more expense to the occupier. And the presence of four souterrain chambers indicates that the people who inhabited this site had um, a reasonably high level of disposable uh, resources. So the main enclosure itself was a habitation and the annex appears to have been as a corral for livestock, so cattle were brought in from the fields and kept in the annex for safekeeping. I suppose we're close to Rathcrohan here, so I'm sure everyone will be familiar with Anton Bokulia. The presumed reason for, not just for this annex, but for a large number of early medieval enclosures having strong defensive elements, is the prevalence of raiding, and in particular raiding for cattle in the early medieval period. Within the enclosure and the annex itself, we found a total of four souterrain chambers. Souterrains are a man-made underground chamber which were used as a refuge or as a, as a place to store food. Effectively, they act as a cold store for food, usually butter and cheese. The souterrains that were uncovered in site are generally, they're, they're typical of the type found in the west of Ireland. They consist of a single chamber. They have, measured between four and five meters in length and about two and a half meters in width. Depth would be about 1.6 meters for three of them and then pseudorain number two which was located in very close proximity to the presumed location of where the bank would be to the interior of the enclosure was extremely shallow. It was 0.8 meters in depth, so just, just under three feet. In pseudorain 3A we recovered a prehistoric polished stone axe and this object was clearly positioned in the wall. And it would seem that the people who constructed the souterrain had found this object and incorporated it into the wall of the souterrain itself. And it's possible that it was incorporated as a, as a good luck charm or something along those lines. Two of the four chambers had drains running from the low-lying end of the souterrain just to carry water away from them. The drain running from souterrain one ran into the enclosure ditch itself. 
Suterrain 3B had a stone-lined box drain. It was clearly part of the overall design of the Suterrain itself. In the stone lining for Suterrain 3B, a gap was deliberately left and the box drain to carry the water away it lined up with this perfectly. And just in front of that gap in the uh, stone lining, there was a, a very large flat slab had been incorporated into the wall itself. We may be able to speculate that this was used as a, as a shelf or something like that for storing food. It's probably worth noting as well that the two drains that we have are midway up the walls of the suit drains themselves, so they would have left standing water within these features. In Suterrain 3B we had clear evidence that this was being used as a defensive structure. We had a wall, our stone lining, which had been modified to include a bolt hole and at the base of this we had a spud stone, so that's the stone on which a door would pivot. This door would have pivoted inwards rather than outwards and the bolt hole was positioned in such a way that a bar could be put across the door to block entry. In addition, the way that the door pivoted inwards would have made it nearly impossible for anyone coming in with any kind of hostile intent to access the suit around further if there was people inside. In total we recovered four burials on site, three of which consisted of the burials of children and they were found in the suit rains. So in suit rain one we had two burials but these were recovered from the upper fields. The burials here were orientated east to west so and buried in the kind of standard Christian manner. In suit rain 3b at the doorway I just previously mentioned we found the remains of an individual, a boy of about 12 years of age or so and this individual either fell into the suit rain and died there or was dumped at this location. Uh, it's not quite clear yet uh, until we have full post excavation osteological analysis to determine if possible how he died. A fourth burial was uncovered at the site which was the remains of a woman of about um, 50 years of age or thereabouts. Quite a small framed individual and she was buried again in the kind of standard position one would expect of a Christian burial but was orientated north-south rather than east-west. Among the finds at Killinis 2 was a quern stone found in Souterrain 3b. It is not yet clear if it dates to the early medieval period specialist analysis will verify its date. And if the quern stone is of a later date, it would indicate that the souterrain was still open in the later medieval or perhaps even the post-medieval period. Other finds included a fragmented bone comb. Also found were copper alloy dress pins of about 12 to 15 centimeters in length, which were contemporaneous with the excavated features. There were a number of whittle and tang knives found. These consist of a blade with a tang where a wooden or bone handle would have been attached. I suppose other than the early medieval period, we do have evidence for Bronze Age activity in the vicinity of Killing East, which included burnt spreads at Killing East 3 and 4 and a ring barrow at Killing East 1. So burnt spreads are probably the most commonly excavated archaeological monument we have in Ireland. They're generally found in wet areas, they consist of a pit which is excavated below the water table. So the pit will naturally fill up with water. And nearby sandstone will be heated in a fire. Once the sandstone was sufficiently warm, this would be put into the, the pit containing water and it could bring the water to the boil quite quickly. A further feature excavated at Killinis 2 was a large rectilinear of uncertain date, possibly Norman, but possibly also much earlier, maybe even prehistoric. Like the finds, the inhumations and the more identifiable features excavated at Killing East, work to interpret the provenance of the rectilinear feature will continue during post-excavation analysis, long after the physical excavation of the site has been completed.